<laughs> so if you guys hit got it for the recording. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our third session of our webinar series. Um, I am Jennifer Kutcher. I am currently the vice president of the BC Grain Producers. Um, we will be recording this event to build content for our new YouTube channel so that uh, you can tell all your friends to uh, log on and look at our YouTube channel while the baby there sitting on a tractor or in a grain truck or waiting in the line at the elevator. <laughs> um, th this will be available um, within an hour after um, we close the session. So uh, Kristen will get that posted. And just for to make sure that we have really good video quality, if you could please mute yourself when you are not talking and you will find that button in the bottom left hand corner of your screen. Um, also, if you are like me and have poor internet connection and get the dreaded you're unstable on your video screen, you can um, take your, turn your video off, which is also located in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, this will just help, help with making it a lot clearer for you. Um, although we aren't able to offer you any sort of coffee or muffins or any treats, at the end of the week, Kristen will be sending out a survey. If you fill out that survey, your name will get entered into a draw and you will get a BC Grain Producer swag bag. Um, so that clears up the housekeeping. Uh, I don't know if we want to wait a couple more minutes for more people to join us or if we should just power through. Might as well power through. So I'll introduce you all to Jackie. Jackie was raised at Toad River on the Alaska Highway in her family guide outfit business. Uh, her family moved to a farm four miles south of Motney in 1978. After finishing school in Fort St. John, Jackie worked for the BC Ministry of Forestry for 13 years, the last seven as a corporate service manager in Fort St. John. She left she left government in 1997 and began consulting. While working for the North Peace Economic Development Commission, she began working on the railroads file and continued with them and the Ministry of Transport through 2007. She relocated to Strathcona County east of Edmonton in 2015 after selling the family farm and was asked to come back to reevaluate and ultimately reboot the railroad project in 2017. So, <laughs> Jackie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, pleased to be here today. And I'm going to start the presentation with a video that we prepared in 2020. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to share this with a lot of people yet, because guess what? We were in the middle of pandemic at 2020. But it's, a, a, it's very concise. It's 10 minutes, and it kind of explains the background, what our objectives are. And it's designed for community groups. We've got a shorter one that's designed more for the ministerial level, because you very seldom get 10 minutes to present to a minister. Um, so, and this, you're welcome, um, Jennifer, if you want to link to the, to this video on your uh, YouTube page as well, it's, it's good to get it out there, but you're welcome to do that as well. So, so I'm going to ask that Kristen go ahead and run the video and then I have a presentation um, to run after or to run through with you after this. So. Can you guys see it on the screen? Perfect. <laughs> As I can make sure that before I hit play. There we go. You might just have to pull back to the start. It looks like you're a little ways into it. There you go. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yep, there you go. Ready? The North Peace Rural Roads Initiative is sponsored by the Peace River Regional District Rural Electoral Area B and the districts of Taylor and Hudson Hope. Working collaboratively with local industry, the initiative was originally formed in late 1997 after the complete collapse of the rural road network. At that time, inadequately constructed roads combined with record levels of heavy industry traffic and extraordinary precipitation resulted in nearly 2,000 kilometers of road in the North Peace that was devoid of gravel and all but impassable when it rained. Efforts by the Rural Roads Task Force demonstrated the importance of first-time hard surfacing of key transportation corridors. This led to millions of dollars of road investment in the Northeast, including the $100 million oil and gas initiative too, 
and motivated the Ministry of Transportation to implement regional transportation advisory committees across the province to replicate the success and benefits of the task force. The task force identified a grid of roads that could effectively move traffic north, south, and east, west in the agriculture area, and roads that were either primary or only access to large tracts of ranch land and were important collector roads for industry. In 1997, there were very few hard surface rural roads in the North Peace. Between 1998 and 2013, substantial progress was made strengthening and hard surfacing roads to fill in the grid. The current task force remains fully committed to upgrading the balance of the rural roads in the grid to hard surface, capable of 100% legal axle loading year round. So why are there so darn many rural roads in the North Peace? Well, it's farm country, and many of these roads were built by and for the agriculture industry when the area was first settled, using horses like pictured here in 1931. A common practice when they encountered soft spots was to corduroy the road with trees to add strength. The roads weren't fancy, but they met the needs at the time. This was the road to Hudson Hope in 1955. As more settlers moved in, they extended the roads out along the Dominion surveyed road allowances that ran every two miles east and west and every mile north and south. The North Peace is deeply incised by big river valleys like the Peace and the Beaton, and over time, roads followed the wagon trails through these valleys, forming the foundation for today's rural road network. The North Peace soils grow good crops, but they erode easily, making the region prone to slides like this one on the Beaton Hills in 2001, and this one on the Peace Hills in 2019. If the geography and soils haven't changed over the decades, one thing that sure has is the size of the equipment used in the agriculture industry. A short venture out on any rural road during spring planting shows an impressive display of technology and horsepower. These massive machines vastly improve farm productivity while reducing the carbon footprint tracks and wide tire profiles mitigate soil compaction. They're more fuel efficient, are capable of pulling multiple implements and offer an impressive wingspan. And it's not just the tractors that are bigger. Gone are the five ton grain trucks. Big equipment requires big rigs to keep it full. Just look at the size of that tractor sitting next to a half ton pickup. The tires on one side are bigger than the whole truck. When one field is complete, that tractor has to go out onto a rural road to travel to the next one. This bad boy takes up a little bit more than a lane. This farmer had the misfortune of meeting a loaded truck along the narrow Prescottu Road, and the resulting collision cost thousands of dollars of damage for both parties. Through the busy summer hay season and into fall harvesting, farmers are out on the rural roads daily with equipment much larger than this modest sized combine. From the grain farmers to the livestock ranchers, the North Peace agriculture industry is completely reliant on safe, reliable roads to move within the region and to transport their commodities to market. If agriculture is the founding father of the North Peace, the forest industry has been the economic steady eddy. Another industry that's progressed a long way since 1951 when this Fort St. John Lumber Company photo was taken. When the rural roads fail, both the truckers and the forest companies are hurt. Most logging truck drivers are small businesses or owner operators, and the damage from rough roads hits the bottom line through an increase in operating costs and potential downtime. For the forest company, reduced hauling efficiencies impact the delivery of wood to the mill. If there's not enough inventory in the yard going into spring, the mill is in jeopardy of shutdown, affecting even more jobs. Like other parts of the province, the North Peace forest industry is currently struggling. This too shall pass, and when it does, the industry requires safe, reliable rural roads to make the economics work. The last of the big three industries is energy. Oil and gas exploration began in the North Peace in the 1950s along the very limited existing road network. Conventional development, where single wells were drilled over a wide area, continued until the mid-2000s. That resulted in widespread development on almost every rural road. Where the infrastructure is still active, regular visits are required by both light and heavy vehicles. 
where the wells are now inactive, decommissioning and restoration activities are taking place. To meet government targets of restoring 10,000 wells by 2034, 625 wells per year will have to be restored. That activity will generate thousands of heavy loads of equipment hauled in and out to decommission, along with the loads of buildings, pipe, tanks, and other infrastructure that must be removed. While there continues to be activity throughout the Northeast, the current focus of gas development is unconventional in the liquids rich North Montney Clay. The North Peace will be the source for at least 25% of the gas for the $40 billion LNG Canada project. Long after the construction dust settles in Kitimat, the only gas producing region of the province, the Northeast, will continue to see its road infrastructure taxed by long-term operations to support LNG. The oil and gas industry not only has the most frequent loads, it has an appetite to build and transport exceptionally large loads. Three quarters of the permitted extraordinary loads hauled in BC are in the Northeast. People who are most negatively impacted by vehicle damage and repairs from poor rural roads are the workers, owner operators, and small businesses who contract with the major producers. One of the main reasons the road grid with 100% legal axle loading is so important is to mitigate the damaging effect of seasonal load restrictions. The clay soils unique to this region of BC, when thawing or wet, have a consistency not unlike peanut butter. In the past, load restrictions occurred at a time when industry was also shut down due to field conditions. But now, the use of mats allows both the forest and oil and gas industry to continue to work through spring breakup if the roads are not restricted. So are the rural roads industry roads? No, they're public roads and for nearly 200 days a year, these same roads are hauling kids to school. More than 12,000 residents live in rural North Peace along with the residents of the Doig, Blueberry and Halfway River First Nations. So whether it's rural residents traveling to the service centers to use medical, educational, retail, or recreational services, or workers and outdoor enthusiasts traveling out for work or play, the rural roads are the social and economic backbone of the North Peace. There have been tremendous improvements in the rural road network since this initiative began, but there are still many roads that were built for generations past which have never had proper bases constructed currently have poor drainage and do not have enough gravel to support the type and volume of traffic they receive. Maintaining high volume gravel roads in a region with a rapidly diminishing aggregate supply while limiting year-round economic prosperity doesn't make sense. This region, which has long contributed a disproportionately high return on investment to the province, requires safe, reliable roads with the grid of roads we identified upgraded to legal axle loading year round. Great, thank you for playing that, Kristen. It was a bit jerky for me here. I don't know how it was for everyone else, but certainly if you wish to, to see it, um, you can link it off your um, uh, YouTube page or you can go watch it on Facebook. It's not that jerky um, firsthand, so. So um, I'm going to just kind of launch in. I've got a few slides. I just want to kind of bring you up to date. So that's kind of the background on this project and what our ask is. I'm just going to confirm some of the things that we've done since we rebooted in 2017. And then the rest of the time, I'm available to answer any questions. So unless anyone wants a question answered now, um, I'll go ahead and run the presentation. I'll make a plan. Okay, I need to share this. And I need to get it into presentation view. All right. 
So um, thank you for joining me. And I have to say that the DC Green Producer sign in the video was not added for this presentation. It's been there since I did it. Um, I went out in uh, uh, the spring of 2019, I think, or maybe spring of 2020, and uh, did some uh, photography work. And I thought that's a perfect sign for my video. So I wasn't sucking up to you. So our current ask, and it, it's pretty clear in the video, our entire business case has always been based around legal axle loading. Um, and right now, um, I've actually got this. <laughs> just, so I wonder what you look at. I looked at this thing a dozen times. And um, right now, retain, uh, we were mostly concerned with retaining, but now we're concerned also with regraining. So kind of ignore bullet number one. So right now, our priority is to regain where we have lost 100% legal axle loading, retain it where we have it, and upgrade the rest of the grid in that map um, to 100% legal axle loading. Continue to build pull-outs. Um, one of the things that, um, and this is really, I think, more of a North Peace issue than, than the South Peace, because I think this, when the South Peace started um, paving roads, it was after we had gone through some of the learning um, pain and their roads weren't built quite as high and narrow. But if you're in the North Peace, you know the roads that I'm talking about, those early ones that were done are really high and really narrow and particularly for farm equipment. And I have to credit uh, Ernest Weeb for bringing this forward. He, he really wanted to see the roads wide and it, there's just, it's a non-starter. We can't go there. So he said, what about pullouts? So we went up and worked with the community of Presbytu and got a group together and identified some places for pullouts. We got some pullouts built and that's been a, a project that's been really um, easy, fairly easy for the ministry to accommodate us. They don't cost that much and they've been helpful. We just need to continue. Unfortunately, last year with all the land use issues in the North Peace um, resulting from the Blueberry um, decision, the Supreme Court decision, we were not able to, the ministry was not able to put any pullouts in place. Graveling, ditching and brushing has been a mantra for ours of 25 years. And then slide management. Um, when you see the map on the next page, if you're not from the North Peace, you'll see that slide management is a real problem for us. So every place you see an X on that screen, there's a serious slide there. And like the upper halfway right now, there's a couple that will completely cut that community off depending which ones go and when they are. There's like, what have I got there? Um, there's now nine slides on the upper halfway road some of them minor and some fairly significant. Almost all the water crossings have slides on them. There's, there's slides on both sides of the Peterson's Crossing here at the Milligan, um, down closer to Fort St. John, of course, the infamous um, uh, hill on the way out to Rose Prairie, the uh, Montney Cooley is a disaster. The Cecil Lake Hill has been on the move um, steady in the Beaton Valley. There's serious sliding in behind Taylor on that uh, emergency road that goes up into Baldonnell. And then I think all farmers are familiar with the ones on the um, Clayhurst and the, um, um, oh, the other road that's coming down there in, into the um, Karen Gooding's most least favorite road. Sorry, it's slipping my mind right now. And then the Farrell Creek Hill has, has done a ton of sliding. So this, this is again our grid. We, this is what we presented to government last fall. Um, that road is gonna bother me, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Um, so we, we've, the roads that are blue were once 100% legal axle loading and we've lost them. So the bottom part of the Beaton Airport, which is a great concern for industry because there's a, a, a uh, disposal, uh, the only dirty dirt disposal site in the North Peace there, and then the road, the Beaton Road, or the Buick Road that goes across is no longer 100%, and the Milligan PJ is no longer 100%. So that's a real concern to lose what we worked so hard to get. Um, so those are great concerns. Some of the roads um, that are in pink are our priorities. The, the upper end of the Beaton Airport Road, the pink road at the very top, seems like an unlikely road to be a high priority. But they hauled millions of dollars of gravel out of the Site C pondage last year and put it on that road. So we elevated that as a priority because it will only take six or seven years and that millions of dollars of investment will be gone if they don't put some sort of a cap on it. So we really elevated the north end of the Beaton Airport Road to, to protect that gravel uh, after it was invested 
um, and being hauled out of there. So, so that's kind of our, our mantra. It's this grid was selected back in 1997-98 uh, when we first started and there's been very few changes to it. Probably the Farrell Creek um, more because there was hardly any development down there. It and Burrow were not as important then as they are now because they kind of are the south entry into the uh, North Montney gas play. But the other roads are all pretty much the same. In fact, they are exactly the same roads. Um, a, a difference up here, either Pink Mountain or Cypress was, was not on the previous one, but because of gravel hauling out of there, they've been added. So, so that's our ask. It's been our ask for 25 years now, and we continue to beat the drum on it. In terms of some of the things that we've done, when we rebooted back in 2017, it was the uh, Peace River Regional District. Actually, the North Peace Economic Development Commission was still in play in late 2017, then the regional district. So one of the things that has been really, really strong is a commitment from our leadership. And the three that have been there right from the beginning and have now formed a coalition, our uh, regional district um, area B director, Karen Goodings, who sent her uh, apologies. She would like to have been here today, but she's in another meeting. District of Hudson Hope, we had uh, Mayor Johansson and now Mayor Heiberg in there and Mayor Fraser from Taylor. They've been just rock solid. Director Sperling um, was part of the initiative between 2017 and 19. And in 2020, the city of Dawson Creek uh, felt that it was really an important initiative because economic development, whether it's in the North or South Peace is good for the peace and he contributed that year. Uh, we have regular meetings um, with, um, the coalition, um, you can see the numbers there, 14, 11, 10, 8. Of course, it dropped off during um, COVID a bit because it's very difficult to lobby when you're um, not able to, to meet with people. Uh, we do an annual budget work plan, do monthly reporting and monitoring. Oops, there's a thing on there. So the Railroads Task Force has been the backbone of this initiative since it started. And it's it was uh, really important when we regrouped that we put a, together a strong uh, task force again they the the coalition runs the business they run the 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 budget you know they make key decisions about where we're going to present and things like that but in terms of all of the decisions about what are our priorities which roads are selected that's all selected by the task force we have a very uh, diverse group agriculture forestry oil and gas transportation and small business uh, we developed a new charter in terms of reference for this group uh, this year. It's a very cohesive team. We very seldom, um, you know, everybody comes and airs their, their differences and has discussions, but we've never, especially since we regrouped this time, um, back in the day, we had the city of Fort St. John in there, and that we that was always challenging. They, had, they didn't want us to go forward at first, and then when we were successful, they wanted to take it over. But we've been just really rock solid as a cohesive team since we came back together. We added some new members in 2020 just to make us a little bit more diverse. And we have uh, regular meetings with them. Again, they have dropped off. For, uh, we were trying to do kind of four meetings a year, but we don't meet unless there's a reason. There's no use dragging. It's hard to get a group together, so we don't drag them out unless, uh, unless there's a reason for it. So. When I first came back, they asked me to do a gap analysis on where things were and whether or not there was any benefit of bringing this forward. And I should say that the North Plain Farmers Institute was behind um, the, the ask to reboot this initiative. So um, they came forward to the regional district and said, you know, we really need to do something about the roads. So uh, Karen Goodings got back in touch with me and said, would I be interested in, in helping them take a look at whether or not there was any value in rebooting this project. So we did a gap analysis and decided to go ahead and regroup. We did that in late 2017. I updated the rural roads in the North Peace report. There's, I think we're onto our sixth revision of it now over the past 25 years. It was revised then, and it was just revised in the last year. As I mentioned before, we had an updated terms of reference, um, done multiple presentations, handouts, newsletters, did the two videos, one that you just saw earlier, plus there's a shorter one geared at um, a senior government. Um, lots of recommendations, specific recommendations on roads, slides, pullouts, um, and we did put a presentation together to the BC Natural Gas uh, Royalty Review. We don't really know if we will get any attention from it, but it's worth asking. So um, we had a lot of momentum uh, meeting with senior government early. Um, we met with the Ministry of Transportation twice, once in 2018, once in 2019. We've had three meetings with the deputy minister in 2018-19. Uh, 
Um, and uh, the regional director, we meet with almost annually. There is a new regional director, director in now, Daryl Dunn. We met with him uh, just in October. We had a really good working relationship with Scott before that and think that we'll be fine, that Daryl's gonna be great to work with as well. Lots of meetings with district managers and, and senior staff um, through, through the uh, time. We were um, very fortunate, or I was very fortunate to be able to present to seven, to the deputy premier and seven deputy ministers, which does not happen very often. That was uh, in 2019. And uh, Energy and Mines and Petroleum Resources, Dave um, Nicolation, the premier assistant deputy minister was very, very supportive. And I met with him uh, four different times and with senior staff of Energy and Mines. That was how we found success the first time around uh, was through um, the oil and gas message. And that was important when we rebooted because the North Pine Farmers Institute kind of wanted to take it forward from an agriculture perspective only. And I didn't feel that I could make a business case without all the industries there. So we also met with BC, or I went to Vancouver, I met with the BC Site C project manager trying to get the Farrell Creek Hill um, to be part of their problem, but I was about seven years too late on that. So when I took this job on again, I said priority one is relationship with the Ministry of Transportation, because if I can't get a good relationship with the district, that's why I was successful in the past. And I feel that of all the things that we've accomplished, this is the most important. Um, I have a great relationship with the district office. I have a strong relationship with the regional office and I can reach out to the deputy minister and our assistant deputy minister and, and get a response, a personal response quite quickly. So that's been very helpful. Um, one of the things that happened in the period between about 2007 and 2017, so that 10 year period when we weren't active, uh, there was changes. Uh, you know, if you've dealt with Modi, there's been, it, for actually any government, there's been a rolling, you know, it's just a re revolving door of, of leadership there. So when we came back, we kind of came in with the assumption that some of the things that we believed in and talked about before had been maintained. And so we kind of came in a little, I came in a little strong. That's not unusual for me. So kind of went from defense of like, who are you? What are you talking about uh, to having a really productive, respectful and mutually beneficial relationship? Um, we provide a value to them by providing vetted rank priorities from a multi-stakeholder, multi-region perspective. So our task force is not only all different um, disciplines in terms of industry, but they're from all different areas. We've got people from Mountain Hudson Hope, Presbyterian, out in the Cecil Lake area, you know, all different. So they really, when they come together, when we vet a priority and put it forward to them, they feel relatively comfortable that someone's not going to come up and go, well, that's completely misguided because nobody's, you know, putting forward. And, you know, Ernest is a great example. He, there's some things that he would really like to see done, but he sits there and he, he kind of looks at all the, all the arguments and he, he gets behind the initiative that's best for the entire region. So uh, as I mentioned at the start, we're really appreciating his contribution here. And I do some legwork to support our asks. So I've gone out and ground truth pull out locations on most of the roads that we consider to be eligible. Um, and what we're looking at there is not pull outs on every road. We're looking at pull outs on those high narrow roads that, that agriculture equipment and wide loads can't pass and meet on. So, so we've developed a really strong trust relationship both ways. And to me, priority one has been achieved. Now, Catherine Steiba uh, left in January. Unfortunately, she was a real asset. She was very invested in this region and very strong, very, um, um, you know, she, she had strong views. She represented the ministry well, um, but she was very, um, very willing to listen to us and very willing to work with us. So we're gonna go through that revolving door of, of people again, and we're gonna have a new district manager, hopefully, we're hoping they're in place by, by March or April, and then we have to start building that whole relationship over with them. In the interim, we're very fortunate. Hallie Davenport's been with the ministry for 30 years. She's very level-headed, and she's taken the helm over on numerous occasions in the past. So it's, in our opinion, in very good hands right now. So some of the other key activities that we've done, we've presented to the BC Finance Committee every year since 2018. We had an opportunity before COVID hit to meet with uh, two of the three First Nations, Doig and Blueberry in the Northeast. 
Um, we had some director roundtables in Cecil Lake and Goodlow where we presented the video that you watched earlier. Did a helicopter tour with Modi, MEMPR and OGC. And uh, we've been putting out a regular newsletter. So we've had some community meetings that we have felt pretty good about the results from. Uh, Presque 2, as I mentioned before, um, when, we, when Ernest asked about pullouts, they invited us up, Karen and I went up and had a really good uh, meeting at Presque 2, developed their priority list for, for pullout construction, and we got some of them going uh, the next year. We were asked to go out to the Milligan PJ. They got a group together to talk to us about because the pavement that, for, that was formerly done through the oil and gas money was breaking up and they were concerned that it was going to get um, kind of eradicated and that road would be allowed to go back to gravel. And so we took, uh, put a little business case together, took it into Moti and they put, I remember it was four or six million dollars into that Milligan project and did an overlay on it. And we were out in 2020, Karen and I, again, to the uh, Lower and North Cash group. They were very concerned with some pretty bad conditions out there. And uh, the feedback we got from them that, that that critical maintenance was completed. We tend not to get involved with maintenance. It's really outside of the, of the, um, the mandate of this group. We focus on you know, the economic benefits and on the uh, upgrading the grid, but where, um, grain can't come out where they lost some livestock due to bad roads. That is an economic factor that we thought we needed to get involved with. And uh, they were quite happy with the results of that from what we heard. So the pullouts, talk a little bit about those. Those address the concern of the narrow steep shouldered paved roads. Uh, they're around $100,000 a piece to build. Um, 2019, there was one on the Presbyterian roads. In 2020, I went out and ground truth multiple locations and then we prioritized them with the task force, which ones to do. Uh, in 2020, there was four completed on Presby 2, Beaton Park and Clayhurst Roads. And as I mentioned with the land dispute or the land uncertainty and permitting, they did not do any in 2021. But I talked to Hallie uh, a couple of weeks ago and they're getting on that and, and hoping to get those uh, back rolling this year. Very nice because of the price point there's something that they can do that benefits not only uh, our group users, but also CDSE and the RCMP school buses, groups like that. So, um, so some financial impacts. Um, Agile, one of the things that we were very concerned about was through the oil and gas initiative, we were able to get incremental money coming in and it came into the North piece and the South piece. And um, that money, um, I mean, it was, it was a lot of money at the time. When, when we started this, we said, you cannot cut our budget anymore because that was so, shortly after the NDP came in. And the feedback we got is, had we not been there so strong at the time, that existing $20 million budget um, probably would have been cut by 10 to 20%. And then you know that this region can't handle that. So, you know, there's been some definite uh, value there. The pullout program, you know, there's at this point five done at 100,000. The Milligan there, it was $4 million. Um, there's been some indirect impact. You know, you can't tell whether or not it was our lobbying that did it or whether it was in a plan, but there was a hot in place recycling of 59 lane kilometers in 2020 on the Rose Prairie Road. Um, side road patching, Milligan, Montney, Siphon, Clayhurst. These are all roads that we keep advancing as being important. Uh, and we're seeing results on them. So, you know, we're not necessarily taking credit, but I think we're influencing it. And we are having influence on the gravel um, program input and response. So, so that is um, my presentation and I would be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jackie. I just have one quick question. Well, I have a couple questions, but okay. <laughs> the first question is, how come this is just a North Peace task force? How come it doesn't cover the whole region? Like, is it because of budgeting or just the issues are different? Like, why is it just for the North? Well, I'll tell you what, um, that is, a, that's, a, <laughs> this has been going around for 20 years, 25 years, really. So back in, I'm going to say probably about 2003, we were working, yeah, 2003, 2004, we were working towards putting together a South Peace um, uh, Robots Task Force. And um, 
it kind of, it, we, we just had struggle, we struggled finding the cohesiveness that we did in the North piece. And I think some of it is based on, um, and I, I totally anticipated this question. So I actually have a couple more slides that I'm going to, to walk through. But it, the one thing that prevented it from going forward is that the Ministry of Transportation, and I mentioned that in the video, introduced rural um, uh, regional transportation advisory committees across the region. So what that resulted with is that that, that group was for the entire Northeast. So that included Port Nelson and included the South piece as well. I should move because I keep looking sideways because I got you on the other monitor here. So that's the, the short answer of why it didn't happen. Um, every time I present to the to the regional district, um, particularly um, Mayor Bumstead brings up this should be a, a, a regional, a full regional initiative. And I don't disagree with that, but the regional, um, the South Peace regional directors were invited every time to participate and they chose not to. But I'm going to show you some of the differences that make our argument is based on legal axle loading year round. And that, that has been the only, the only true business case I can find. Um, I can't make a business case for a rough road. I can't make a business case to pave a road to, you, you know, if there was, a, there was an infrastructure, um, you, you know, looking through the agriculture lens, you don't have a, um, you know, you don't have a plant or something like that. I'd say this is a really good business case to, to do that. Your agriculture is on every, every rural road. Um, so the, I'm just going to go back into presentation mode here and pop down and show you a, a few differences in the North and South Peace region and why they make it a little bit more challenging to, um, I'm going to flip past that one. We might talk about it later. That's, so this, this will be very hard to see. So I'll, I'll just kind of leave it up here, but the, the big difference between the North and South Peace, um, and making a business case. It is where you have existing roads. So on the left, if you, th this is obviously a South Peace map. If you look at the yellow, these are all highways. So you've got um, Dawson Creek is, even though it's to the east side of the region, it's got a highway running basically north south and one east west. It's got good access down into the Tumbler Ridge and area. So if you're looking at um, non-agriculture values, um, certainly there's good access down there. And then there's not, again, a lot of agriculture, but there's good access up through to Hudson Hope on that road. And then when you, when you look at your agriculture industry, which is you know, where on the North piece, we've put a lot of focus, your agriculture industry, the Alaska Highway, the North Alaska Highway kind of cuts almost halfway through it. Your Rolla Road, which is a 100% year round road, goes north, you know, a little bit right of the, the center of it, but it's, it, it dissects quite well there. And then the Hart Highway dissects out to the west, and you've got a little bit of, of ag land and that out here. Then the completion of the, um, the, the, um, Oh gosh, help me with the road that goes from the honey farm that comes out on Highway 97, uh, Braden, the Braden Road, upgrading that help. So when you look at the South Peace, there's not a lot of areas you can say there's a real, there's a real missing link there. When you look at the South or the North Peace on the right hand side, you see that our Fort St. John is just at the drop bottom of the, the district. And it's got the one highway out to Hudson Hope and then it's got the Alaska Highway that almost misses the agriculture industry not the ranching industry but the agriculture industry so if you take all these solid lines off the right the the north piece you'll find that there was just no there was no year-round access out into the the north piece until we started working on this project and there was no access again out into that ranch country like the upper halfway is that green one on the left coming out halfway up to the west and then these roads coming up off the bottom the cash roads and stuff like that off the Hudson Holt Road so um, it our argument was a little easier to make because there was just no access out into the the way the agriculture industry and the the farm and of course the, at the time that we made this in the initially every place there was a road there was oil and gas and in a lot of cases there was um, uh, logging so 
The Beaton Airport Road, if you're not familiar with it, takes off kind of the center of the screen and up. That's an important um, forestry road, as is the Milligan PJ, which is the one to the furthest right. And of course, the, the roads, all the roads going west of the Alaska Highway and north from the, the um, uh, Hudson Hope Road are, are quite important. So they just, they have a different, um, it's not to say that you couldn't be successful in the South Peace, but I don't know how we would make the same business case in the South Peace. So from what I'm getting from you saying is the South Peace is more maintenance issues and maintaining already existing infrastructure, whereas North Peace is building up and to 100% axle load, whereas Dawson Creek already has that? Um, Dawson, all of them could use more 100% roads. Um, and, I, and I've got some, another slide here that will kind of compare the, the, where we're at in the two districts. It's amazing for as different as these two districts look on a map how very similar they are when you when you just look at the hard numbers but that um there are tons trust me there are tons of maintenance issues in the north piece as well particularly around the slides the slides are really a big concern in the north piece but there's lots of maintenance issues in, in and we like i said before that is really outside of the scope of this organ this um initiative because um it's it, it, these are my opinions. If you want to get into maintenance, you've got to get in between the Ministry of Transportation and their business partner, the maintenance contractor. And having worked for government, has been worked as a contractor, I feel that that's a non-starter and something you're just not going to be successful with. You either got to deal with a maintenance contractor and build a relationship, or you got to deal with ministry and build a relationship, but getting in the middle is a, a really poor place to be my opinions only. So that's kind of in a nutshell, when you look at it from a math perspective, that's the big difference in how our argument has worked in the past. Now, having said that, we have not got, since we rebooted in 2017, we have not got a single new stitch of pavement. So um, the successes that we're getting are much more modest that they, than they were previously. Uh, we're still hopeful, but um, fairly, um, resigned in the current environmental light that we are probably not going to get more hard surfacing at this time. The differences in the two areas, and I looked at from a road restriction, seasonal load restriction view, is very interesting because when you look at the roads, the South Peace is, and I could be a slight bit off on rural, I had to classify these whether they were rural or not, and so some you know, there's some frontage roads, you can tell what they are, but some of them are roads that go, you know, maybe between like that 8th Street and the next road in, in um, Dawson Creek. I called that a city road and I called some in Fort St. John city roads because I, you know, I consider the roads coming in from the rural areas, but this is fairly close. So there's 1,946 kilometers of rural roads in the South Peace and 1,946 kilometers. Of, I, I had to literally go back and check that I did not have that long um, and those are correct. So when you actually look at the numbers here, what's different between the, the two districts is you've got quite a bit more 100% road, highway road, of course, because you've got those roads going down to Tumbler Ridge. In the North Peace, you've only got Highway 97 and, the, and Highway 29. You've got more rural 70% roads than um, we do, but we, because we've lobbied really hard to get some of these 75% roads and plus we've got some of our rural roads up to 100%. So, you know, the North piece is, is a little bit different there, but it's remarkable how similar these two, um, two regions are in terms of um, their rural road network, looking at it through the lens of the restriction. When you look at through the lens of classification, because I thought there might be more difference here too. So I looked at summer class because generally if it's a class eight road, it's, it's actually an 8F. So that means it's not maintained in the summer, it's not maintained in the winter. And I actually thought that the South piece, which is shown here in gray, had more um, uh, 8F roads than the North piece, but it's, it's relatively equal. So again, when you look at class three, so that's the highest maintenance class, that's because you've got more paved road. Uh, class four, you've got a little bit more than the North Peace in the South Peace in class five. Um, there's more um, in the North Peace and then in class six again. But there's, the, there's just, 
the real big difference between these two districts in terms of making a business case is where the roads are. Sorry, that was a very long response, but I, I anticipated that question because I always get it. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Um... Yep. I mean, it, it's there's still parts that are unclear, but I, that makes sense as far as if you go from the business case perspective. Yeah, and we, you know, we, we've taken a very conscious effort. And um, honestly, when the North Pine Farmers Institute asked us to come in, they wanted to focus on maintenance. And I basically told the regional district, if, if it was maintenance, they had the wrong consultant. Um, it's not something that I'm, um, I'm comfortable in focusing on. That's all relationship. That's all on, um, you know, working with the, the locals to improve it. Um, and of course, the more pavement you get, the better your maintenance issues are because the roads that in the north piece that need to be upgraded, that's where all your maintenance dollars are going because they're high traffic, they're getting beat up by industry, and they need, if they were hard surfaced, the maintenance would drop and it would allow more time out on other roads. One of the things that we did find, um, Bruce Mackay, uh, former highways manager, is, is works with me on my, on my team, and we went out to spring of 2018 and we hit, and I do, I go out every year and hit the roads, but we hit a lot of roads. And the one thing that was really obvious is from the new pavement that had come in, the gravel had gone a lot further. So they had taken, instead of, you know, repairing Galata Creek, there's the one I couldn't remember before, instead of hauling gravel to Galata Creek and repairing it, Actually, that's a poor example. Let me say, let me take the, the Presbyterian Road. Instead of continually putting gravel on the Presbyterian Road to keep it held up, they were able to take and put gravel out on more of the side roads. So compared to when this project started, and for those of you who recall, 1996 was the year that our roads sunk into the gravel. I mean, it was so wet, we lost everything. Our entire infrastructure crumbled that year. So there was no gravel to be seen anywhere in 1997 when we started this but in 2017 2018 and even today there is way more gravel on the secondary roads so not these these ones that we've got identified but the other roads the gravel situation is much better but we're losing our gravel you know the the diminishing gravel is something we're focusing on right now trying to quantify how much how quickly we're losing it because what are we going to do right right now that gravel hole they took from the the site c pondage up to the Beaton Airport was millions and millions of dollars, not counting the gravel. I don't know the number, but I'd like to. So are you actually saying that the, the resource is diminishing or are you saying that the we're losing gravel on the roads? Well, both. The, okay. the, the, yeah, <laughs> we are running out of gravel in the Northeast because the only place there's, there's um, road quality gravel that we know of is along the piece and along the beaten. And I know a lot of our gravel uh, from the North Piece goes to the South Piece, like that those pits down on the um, um, Galata Creek Road, a lot of that gravel goes south because I understand from talking to Bruce that actually the South Piece gravel situation is as dire if, if not more so even than the North Piece. So, and one of the big differences is when, when industry went, uh, when the oil and gas industry went from conventional to non-conventional, when it was conventional, they just went out, they built a, a lease in the road conditions that they could, they drilled, they completed, you know, put in infrastructure and then they moved on. But once they moved to non-conventional, they started move, building these massive pads. And I'm hearing stories of up to hundred loads of gravel going in on those big pads. So that's a huge draw on the on the gravel resource um, going to oil and gas. Now, I think the future of oil and gas is questionable right now, but um, they've depleted a, a large quantity of, of traditional uh, road gravel in the last 10 years. I have a question, Jackie. Um, from your one of your first maps in the losing our 100% um, in some of our roads. Oops, Have we sorry. lost the 100% on the, from the Rose Prairie Road to the Milligan? Yes. Um, what will it take to get that back? Or, and I, 
I see there's a difference between from the Upper Pine School to Peterson's Crossing is probably should be classified different than the actual Milligan on the other side. Um, I think ours yeah. has been in place longer. Well, and you know, I, I brought this to their attention last spring and I'll be watching for it this year, but they had, you know, they had the intent that um, you could get, how did that work? They, they had, um, they had a piece missing that, that didn't even go to 75% because the Milligan stays at 75%. But they had a chunk missing out of the road restriction, and I brought it to their attention. So I'm hoping this year that they do um, at least get it over to the crossing at 100%, because that road was all upgraded. But last year, uh, it was at 70. In fact, I think it was at 70%. I don't think anybody really paid any attention to it. But um, there was definitely a, a problem. It, and what happened is it the road used to be classified as a Milligan from the corner uh, where it joined with the Rose Prairie. That's where they used to consider it starting. And now they consider it starting uh, where it turns east off the North Pine uh, grid there. Right. But that, yeah, at this point, uh, like in the last season, that's exactly what it was. It was, um, I think it was 75%. Well, if you need an argument, uh, we are, we're shipping uh, barley to Chilliwack and it's gonna be the last four miles that are gonna be 75% on a, whatever that is, a 1400 kilometer trip. Yeah. Um, we're- I think, I think Modi has been um, pretty open to helping the agriculture industry out with exemptions, yeah. um, more so than, than other industries. They've had, the other industries have had to bond. Like if, um, if the oil and gas industry or forest industry wants a road through load restriction period. But my understanding that exemptions were quite easy to get uh, last year in the North Peace. So I hope that they continue to be because they do recognize, you know, and, and Ernest brought the issue of the, the lags with rail cars and how that is impacting and even the, like Catherine Stiber, the former district manager said, if you can do something with BC Hydro to get them so that they stay on track and don't hit all the empty cars during load restrictions, you know, so we wrote a letter, but who knows um, whether we never got a response, um, which was not surprising. I don't think they're terribly responsive to that type of approach, but, um, and we actually shared it with the local producers and the, the one in Dawson Creek, the smaller one, I can't think of who it was, they were quite concerned with the message because they thought we were encouraging not to allow hauling. And it was just the opposite. We were saying, you gotta, uh, you gotta get those grain cars in when they're due and try and avoid that spring breakup period. But I think, I think agriculture exemptions, if you're not getting them, um, you need to raise some stink because unless the road is really gone to hell, I think they will give you an exemption to haul. Another question then on kind of on the same road, it was hot, they did the hot surfacing in 2020 yeah. on the Rose Prairie Road, which is very much appreciated. Yeah. Um, they start from the Montney Road North, it narrows up and they started to add the gravel on the edge of that new hot surfacing. Okay. And they did, they only got about four kilometers on one side done. And that was back in the fall of 2020. And then winter hit and it kind of needs to be completed. Okay. Um, the, the gravel was in place at the siding there in Montney. And I think they hauled more in there again this year. So yeah, and that's a really good point that we'll bring that up. Uh, in our spring meeting because they did, they filled the Montney side or the, I call the Murdale siding there just south of where I used to live um, and, or sorry, east of where I used to live, but they filled that right up and now they're hauling down to Johnson Pit out of the, the um, site sea pondage area. They are, and we've really, we've really pushed hard that they have to get every stick of gravel out of that pondage because we're, we're running out of gravel and how, how will roads like you know, how will the roads in Presbyteru and out in Cecil Lake and these long hauls, they will become so prohibitively expensive 
they won't be able to hold gravel to them in 20 years. And this, you know, this is a big concern with us. And we're just, um, it, you know, we've kind of had it on the back burner, but we've accepted that, um, especially the, the, this government is on a path uh, right now and we don't fall, the Northeast doesn't fall very well into it, let's be honest. And certainly, um, um, and the, perhaps, perhaps more than ever, the, if there was any silver lining from the flooding last year, I think there is a, a slightly higher awareness and maybe through COVID of the importance of the agriculture industry. So agriculture is probably the only industry that is going to get any favor right now. Forestry and oil and gas are persona non grata right now with this provincial government. So we, we do not have a business case right now. Like we're looking at what, how do we continue to move this initiative forward? Because when we step back before, there was a void, things went downhill, nobody was just kind of keeping an eye on things. So how do you balance being there, um, spending money responsibly? Um, and so gravel is kind of one of those things that we're focusing on. We're focusing on rebuilding relationship with the new person that comes into the district manager role. And gravel is, a, is kind of one of those things that, that we feel there's a long-term benefit I talked to the regional aggregate manager in Prince George. He's very aware. He said they looked at doing some um, geophysical, air geophysical, $14 million to do geophysical to try and find gravel. That's a big, big, big ask um, in this environment. They, they just won't get it. But we need to all collectively be raising the issue of we're running out of gravel in the peace country and it's going to become even a bigger problem for our roads that are high traffic and maintained as gravel roads because you can't maintain a gravel road without gravel. And these roads are, they're muskeg. They don't have, you know, they don't have a base. They don't have anything. When the gravel's gone, they're not, they're not fit to travel. So, so that's one of the things that we're kind of focusing on this year because it's, you know, and trying to find value to continue to just to move this forward. Um, that's the one area that we're, we're putting some focus on now. Thanks, Jackie. Um, what about the Taylor Bridge? What's going on with the Taylor Bridge? The I don't Taylor know. If you guys have... No, we have nothing to do with it. Out of scope. Um, I think that the Taylor Bridge is. Um, I think there's a, a recognition from what I see as an observer that it has to be replaced. Uh, Rob Fraser is very active on our committee, and we have endorsed it as an absolute must. It's a, you know, it's not it's not a rural road, but we absolutely recognize that it's a it's a huge priority for the region to to get that excuse me, to get that bridge dealt with, and um, full, we're fully supportive. I think that um, it's hard to say when, when there's a disaster like there was in the lower mainland and through the canyons and all the flooding that took place, that's repaired, that's not necessarily all repaired from the provincial pot, that's that comes from emergency money, a lot of that will come from the federal government. But there is a concern that resources like engineering resources and things like that could be pulled away right now like that that's I think a legitimate concern that it 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 not necessarily the money to build it because they're not there yet but perhaps some of the resources to work on it um, could be affected with all of the flooding and that because I think that the repairs that they're doing down south are very um very a lot of them are very temporary I don't think I mean they got traffic moving but I don't think they've got those roads rebuilt by any stretch and I mean that the, the mess down the, the devastation is just you know I've never seen anything like that before. So, so that is going to affect. And we wrote, I wrote a letter to the regional director um, a couple of weeks ago. I, I talked to Hallie Davenport about it, uh, main, you know, re-emphasizing how important it is that we not lose our base budget up here because that base budget is is required to keep these roads passable. And you know, we fought for it when the NDP came in, and we asked him to continue to fight for it. He gets um, how challenging this region is. Nobody in Ministry of Transportation doesn't get it. Um, uh, Kevin Richter is the Assistant Deputy Minister and he's from over in uh, Fairview country, I believe originally, but he's been with them a long time. He's really knowledgeable about this and uh, I, he's very tough. Uh, he's very, <laughs> you gotta have your ducks in a row if you can meet with him. But uh, he is very understanding of our challenges up here and he's very approachable. You know, we, we can reach out and talk to him, but uh, he has an answer for, for most uh, asks too. With that, Jennifer, I think um, 
the Taylor Hill is 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 as important as the bridge. Like the ten percent corner is a devastating <laughs> joke, right? Like, um, yeah. I really do hope. Just make the comment. I really hope they fix that when they do the bridge. I um, I, I, I would I, like. Yeah, I doubt it, but I just. The, the problem is, uh, you know, they have spent so much money on that South Taylor Hill over the years until it slides again. I just can't see them putting more into it. And I get it. I pulled a horse trailer up that hill for years and years, and it, it went from bad to so much worse. Yeah. Well, economically, we are losing the, the grain industry is losing money um buyers will pay more on the south side of the hill than they will on the north side of the hill so <laughs> from a reliability we, perspective or a cost uh, a cost perspective? a cost cost and reliability like they don't want to go there on a stone storm um yeah. like a tow tractor they have a tow tractor on that hill when when it snows and it's do you have to pay for, for that federal. yourself yeah it's 150 bucks if he took Sandia out of your pocket and it's a private guy doing it it's it's ridiculous um but. i was under the understanding that was something that government recognized that they had to pay so that's interesting i didn't know that but again that would be a self peace yeah. kind of a self peace challenge that i haven't really looked at for years yeah but doesn't the, i would like to see. doesn't the south taylor hill even impact the north more than it potentially impacts the south like all that grain has to go up that south taylor it doesn't affect the rest of the agriculture producers in the piece other than the north piece yeah and for sure i mean all of the infrastructure the twinning that's been done along the alaska highway that's all important it's just a little bit out of scope for us like we we have really taken the approach you know we've taken <laughs> we haven't tried to take on all the problems um and we nobody there's nobody advocating for rural roads there, there's not a lot of people advocating for rural but we really felt that we were not going to take on all of the roads because as soon as you stack up like it doesn't matter what we what we go like if there's an accident if there's uh, vehicle damage those things is you're up against uh traffic volumes in the lower mainland and accident volumes and congestion through the Okanagan and that. So you, you really have to find a case that, that you can make an argument for. And we, we have focused on the road of the load restrictions because there is a definite cost to load restrictions. Um, they used to be tremendously bad. I mean, literally industry pulled out, the oil and gas industry pulled out in the fall and, or sorry, in the spring, and they didn't come back till, till freeze up. So that happens less now because there is more infrastructure and there's more commitment and things like that. But the, the seasonal load restrictions were something we could build a business case on. And without a business case, um, it's very, very difficult. So, you know, you got, you got to find a battle you think you can win and um, focus on it. So we, we felt that there was nobody advocating. And, you know, I have to give all credit to Karen Gooden. She was the impetus behind this in 1997 she was the one who said we've got to do something and she was the one who brought it back and she still sits today as the chair I don't know what's going to happen when she retires it's uh, you know who's such an advocate for rural when she goes thanks Jackie well, yeah, th thanks. Ditching and brushing, I see it's on your list. It's it's much appreciated and keep on it. <laughs> I'll just share with you the challenge that, I, that the district or the, the uh, railroad task force has with brushing. So um, we always make a lot of noise about brushing. And I was up on the Cypress Road in 2018 and literally, I mean, it was a death trap driving up there. The, the brush was right out to the corner. And if you've ever been on that road, it's windy, it's narrow, it's, it's a nasty little road. And we made a lot of noise and they went in and they brushed it. Now that, I haven't seen that kind of brushing. They brushed it from the, the start of where it turned, kind of turned south all the way in uh, past the residence there. And I drove up there this spring and I, I was gobsmacked. 
And then I went and looked at all the brushing because I had concern from the agriculture industry primarily about some of the, the brushing that took place in the North Pine area. So I went and looked at it and I looked at all the brushing done on the Presbyterian Road and on the Buick Road and the uh, out in, you know, we haven't seen that kind of brushing in a lot of years. And the North Pine was specifically brought forward as a concern through the North Pine Farmers Institute. And, you know, we made it, uh, some noise with, North, uh, with um, DRM to get it done. So then it came back to the task force. Well, it's not good enough. So the cost for mowing, which is what they used to do that work out in the North Pine, is about one fifth of what it costs to do the brushing on the cypress. Because of the brusher, they went in with a brusher, they went in on hand, they, they completely cleaned it out. So then you come back and you go, okay, so we can have, you know, 10 kilometers of the Cypress Road done a year or the Rose Mount, Pink Mountain or whatever road done a year, or we can have three or 400 kilometers of that mowing done a year. And yeah, there's some clumps that they have to go around and there's some misses, but which is better? And we had a lively, lively discussion about this. And at the end of the day, they agreed that more is better. Better is better, is better, but more is better. So um, that's the message that we took back is there are places and we've, um, we have a Facebook page and we ask on a regular basis if to, for people to tell us what they want, because we do, we do have influence in things like brushing. We do have influence in things like graveling. If there's a real mess out there, we'll take it forward for you. Uh, we try not to get too involved with winter stuff, but you know what? If somebody's two or three days into calling DRM and there's no gravel on a road that's a sheet of ice, we'll make a call on their behalf, either myself or Karen, and it usually gets looked after fairly fast. But that's again getting into maintenance, and we don't want to do that. But you know, we ask people where, particularly intersections, because there's and there is a lot of intersections in the North Pine and Rose Prairie area. That people are concerned about. So, uh, you know, I've just given a whole list of intersections that people have identified uh, to the Ministry of Transportation. And those are some of the things that I, you know, for yourselves, if you're looking at uh, ways to improve and to, you know, interact positively with um, both your maintenance contractor and the Ministry of Transportation, I think they're really open to that. What they have trouble with is when, it's, when you just go and say, it all needs done. Because we're so far behind in our road, our road networks, in their qual, you know, in the gravel, in their ditching, and their brushing, all of that stuff. If you just go in and say it all needs done, or just the road to my place needs done, uh, you you don't take the same credibility. But if you get your members to go put a list specifically of exactly where the problems are, you get together and you prioritize some of that because we're not the only voice um, coming into the Ministry of Transportation. Everybody, you know. I know the North Pine Farmers Institute goes in. I'm sure you guys go in and meet with them. But those type of things where you get together and go, okay, so all of the, the um, grain growers in the North Peace got together and we've identified and prioritized the areas where the brushing is most dangerous, where we're most impacted. Those are things that you can do. And I think you, you would find you'd get some positive results from that. They do like, uh, you know, they do like a, an aggregated approach, and that's where we've been successful, where we can bring all the industries together. Your industry is not as straightforward in the South Peace. Um, you know, I, I know you've got kind of oil and gas, and you've got plants, and that's through the agriculture area, but you're, because of the location of the, the North Montney, it's kind of falling all on the south side of, um, or sorry, on the, on the southwest side of, um, your region there. So, you know, whether or not you can get oil and gas involved in that and, and, and get something going, I don't know. But, but you really, you know, if you're looking at trying to start something, I think it's really important that you, you know, determine whether or not you want to try and take something forward from an agriculture perspective. And, and again, you might have a better chance of that than the other two uh, major industries right now. But, you know, what is it that you can make a business case on? Because if you can't, if you, if, if you're just going to go in and complain about the current conditions, you're just a one voice in thousands. So currently we're working <clears throat> with the road contractors and compiling lists of problem roads. That's where we've started. Um, good. It's that a good place to start or? Absolutely. And build the relationship. I can't. 
you know, if I can leave you with one thing, um, I, I worked for government for 13 years. I understand both sides um, of the coin quite well. Um, when people come to me and say, you know, and this is a common thing I say to the ministry, what can I do to help you help me? Mm. Um, what, and like, that was the pullout. So, you know, the, the um, coalition invested for me to go out for three or four days and go out and identify GPS coordinates, find the line of sight, my highways give me a list of, of criteria that they look at, you know, is there cell tower? What's my cell signal? So you, if you can go to them and go, we want to make it better for us and we want to help, you know, what can we do to help you to help us? Um, that's been really successful for our group. And it, it makes that trusting relationship build where you can sit down and you can have tough conversations about things. Um, so I really, um, it, it's sometimes hard to agree with government the way sometimes how they do things. Um, but you're not, you're not going to change that unless you get into a position of, of trust and um, working together. Great. So I, I think we're on the, the right track. We just got to keep the momentum going. Yeah. And, you know, in terms of, of setting up something in the South Peace, if you find something that you think you can get a hold of, and it's certainly worth um, expanding and bringing in the other industries, it, it elevates the argument a lot um, to have the other industries at the table when you're making decisions, because then it's not the agriculture industry against the oil and gas industry against the forest industry or against any other industries so even if you can come up with some um some some ideas and then even just get endorsement and go we've gone to you know shell and we've gone to um you know your other big producers down there and you know i don't know how much they all is the lp plant in dawson running yeah so, you know, if they're still coming in off private land and stuff like that, if you go to them and, and kind of identify what are your concerns, these are ours, can you get behind us? That may be enough to take the initiative, you know, to take some initiative under the grain producers umbrella and just get some of that type of endorsement from them. But you have to remember too, if you're gonna represent the South Peace, do you have to reach out to Tumblr Ridge and mining? Do you have to reach out to Chetwin and their industries? Um, those are all decisions that you, that you have to make. So, you know, where you really don't have a, a toehold or a, a reason to be out there. So, and I think, you know, your regional directors, um, if uh, I think that if they felt they could support you in any way, they will. Uh, we talk roads at, at the regional district pretty often, uh, even though this has gone outside the regional district. That was for administrative purposes. They actually found that they couldn't. Um, in-house do economic development projects it was a technicality in government so but they were able to support the coalition so kind of the, it's still you know definitely being largely funded by the area b here in Whitting's area so. well thank you very much for your time jackie i really appreciate you coming in the other people who have attended the call i see we've lost some people but um <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, any other further questions for Jackie? Okay, um, follow our Facebook page. I try to keep up with, you know, when I see posts that are of interest, um, I ask questions on there sometimes with poll and stuff like that. So keep an eye on the on the web page or on the Facebook page. And uh, if you, you know, we do encourage people to shoot us an email shoot it to me or shoot it to Karen on what's going out there I don't think people are scared of picking up the phone and calling Karen remind